So this is a California drought poem. Uh, what's happening is, in real life, these bears are not able to get enough food. So they're coming down to Lake Tahoe, to the lakeshore, and interfering with the residents. And more and more residents are having to protect themselves from bears, who are cause, the main, main cause of crime at Lake Tahoe. But the crime may be um, against the bears, since they lived there first. So this poem is called The Bear. The bear comes by every night to forage for garbage. Drought has made them smarter. This year, the gooseberries did not ripen, and so these bears are starved, except for attention. They break into cabins, crashing through doors like drunken teenagers to loot the refrigerator even when they're occupied, say, by bridesmaids, who come downstairs half hung over, startled out of their faces, to find them at the kitchen counter, slurping up boysenberry crumble and beer. Pulling down the spice rack, and with their butts turning on the burners, the smell of gas gusting through the broken window glass brings the neighbors who come running, unsure, whether to chase or be chased by them in their baggy, honey-colored coats. They're so thirsty, they would tear open rocks like coconuts to drink whatever's in there because every rill in the high country has become a dribble of dust even before the solstice. The bear comes by every night, suffering the need to live among us we who often become frightened and forget how to use punctuation. The bear comes by every night knowing what the point is. You see them waiting at dumpsters behind Save Mart, watching the clerks lock up. You hear them huffing in the shadows by McDonald's, taking turns, shooting dice, practicing their guttural English. There's never been more of them at the lakeside. Fires have burned them out of their dens. They can't sleep anymore through the winter. Too warm. They're hot in that awful stringy fur they long to shed. Chased through strip malls by forest service cops, they sidle between buildings, sneaking onto beaches where they stand to greet us, holding up their big snarly hands. The bear comes by every night. You suspect they've learned now to outsmart us. We who think how cool it is to live so lavishly, vacationing in our exclusive human skin. This poem is called Flood. Uh, this poem kind of uh, is post-Katrina, uh, post all those hurricanes, imagining um, that they imply something more biblical. Flood. There are children in the trees. We see them from our boat as the waters rise. They signal us to try to reach them, but walking on water can be a problem. And even if there was room, to what shore would we bring them? Anyway, we are poorly provisioned. We won't last two weeks. So what's the point? The fins of TV antennas scrape the hull. We leave a wake of hieroglyphics, an iridescence spreading outward, codices tangled in the reeds, incomplete sentences, alibis for our species, oreos of verbena in the air. A bright garment floats on the tea-colored surface, stems of light sinking through the silt, an opaque layer of brownish yellow a few inches down through which we can almost make out the typography. The smell of humidity hanging over everything. Weeks of rain, then the sun beats down from somewhere the wine of cicadas, 
a scum of algae ripples between rows of corn stalks. A heron launches itself from atop a drowned barn, circling us before it dives into the syrupy current, then emerges from its immersion, bowing its neck, a fish's slippery metallic comma dangling from its mouth. The bird is not intended as a symbol. This poem's called Current, and uh, it's written at the shore of Lake Tahoe uh, late midsummer. Current. I'm careful where I step. Water ripples greenish blue against hot sand. Pebbles mixed with quartz grains and pine needles, sharp amid the duff, blown down from the upper stories of the sugar pines clumped along the beach. Kids falling off paddle boards into the cold lake, voices like stretched brake linings in the dry air. A geometric rim of mountains in the near distance. A few geese float detached on the current. Beside us, a family under a mesh canopy speaks English and Russian. I love the present with its layers of seconds faceted like sparks hammered off the glinting surface. I want to stay here endlessly standing at the convergence of sand and water while we watch them sequestered under the clutter of branches, breathing suntan lotion. I dread the future, yet it arrives little by little. Knowingly, we disappear into it. Our bodies dissolve molecule by molecule swept out to the edge of the intangible where light is compressed into blackness, where red ants crawl in their columns across rotting earth, leaving no more than a trail of resin behind. I think everyone sort of notices, but may not be conscious of all the uh, lilies that shoot up at the beginning of September, sort of marking for me Memorial Day. This is the Amaryllis belladonna lily that comes up without leaves. It's just a, on, a, on a brown stem and a pink lily. So that's what this is called, Amaryllis. You know, summer is almost finished when the Amaryllis springs up. Brown gooseneck stems topped with pink flowers Amaryllis belladonna, naked ladies clustered against houses, downcast, funnel-shaped blooms, the color of Pepto-Bismol. A mass of them lined up, giving off a parched back-to-school scent, the fragrance of freckles, cool, ashy, a boutonniere for fire season. They seem to pop up overnight. I see them everywhere, jutting above wilted mounds of fountain grass, crowding the fences between drought-pummeled backyards. On days when the heat lasts past dusk, we sit out on the patio, sinking into a sticky delirium, fanned by thickening plumes of darkness. How wistful! hearing the crickets shift their gears, the sound like a drug. We feel ourselves swooning, slipping beneath the rumor of a breeze, air lush with August mnemonic perfume, a murmur of voices on the street, disassembled words like the freeway's distant hum, constant washing uselessly through our ears. This is called The End of August. It's a poem about the end of summer in the downtown San Jose neighborhood where I live. Cashless at the end of August, I'll have to live more simply. At home, the hydrangeas have wilted, 
the backyard stripped mostly to the color of straw. The tea roses dried up a month ago, and the little creek behind the house in its arroyo of willows and cottonwoods, where it winds among homeless encampments, is a noxious trickle. Summer is burning out, leaving behind its fried language. Waxy outlines of olive leaves soften as dusk filters through the branches, tinting the sky orange, then crimson, enclosing the horizon in a grainy neon veil. Under the footbridge, denizens of evening dump what they don't need. A ragged nation of thistles is stirring. Neighbors turn on their porch lights and security cameras, afraid to find in the morning beer bottles and condoms in the agapanthas, a residue of last night's migration. They're afraid of break-ins. Their walls scarred with graffiti. They rely on a siren's bipolar wail to chase down gangs of burnt people in frayed jeans and blankets who would inundate the neighborhood, the unwashed, the undocumented, the druggies and drinkers, the incessant babblers. Shouldn't we be kept safe from those who would steal our garbage, who would take food out of our children's mouths? It's all good. Trash on the street should be taken away. I shouldn't have to worry knowing that in a disenfranchised season, I can put what I need on a credit card, then go back to drawing water from a dry well. This is called Sorry I Shot Your Car, and the title is in quotation marks. That's because when I worked uh, in downtown San Francisco for the Commonwealth Club of California and commuted from my home in Oakland daily, um, one time I came back, as the poem explains, and I found a note on my windshield written to me by an OPD member who left his apology and his badge number. Back in the days of Reagan Contra, when we knew all kinds of shit was going down under the maze of the freeway interchange, I commuted in a navy blue three-piece pinstripe suit from Oakland to San Francisco to an office in the Monadnock building. I took BART from the MacArthur station. It was safe to park in the lot. Most days, I could find a space before 10 o'clock, though I had to park in the ruinous sun, but not the Friday after Bud McFarlane came to my office looking for a secure phone line. He told me to go home early, not needing my help with his proxy wars. Though Catholic, he flashed his canines, approving each human sacrifice. Later, I met the police chief of Managua in the Palace Hotel's lobby bar, who paid for coffee, taking a bundle of crisp 20s out of his briefcase. Sandinistas couldn't get a credit card. When they brought El Presidente to San Francisco, not one local official would show up. Each sent word they'd be out of town. So we organized a committee led by Lawrence Ferlinghetti to host the official reception. The police chief of Managua worked security with the Secret Service, knowing where to station sharpshooters in the hotel, having worked there once as a busboy. The press was good. The next Monday, I couldn't find a space in the BART lot, so desperate to make the train, I parked on the crepuscular street beneath the on-ramp. When I got back after work, I found a note on my windshield shoved under the wiper blade. Sorry I shot your car. The perp was firing at us from behind it. Then a name, a badge number, and the number for the Oakland police garage. Sure enough, there was a three-inch hole punched through the left rear fender. You could see all the way into the wheel well. 
the note said, for the repair, there'd be no charge. Luckily, the slug didn't hit the gas tank and blow up the damn car. This was our new used 1985 speed Corolla wagon. The paint job still clean. My claim to be indeterminately middle class. I had a wife, a baby, a refinanced house. You could barely afford the Pioneer cassette deck I had installed and was afraid would be stolen, though I tucked the face plate into my inside coat pocket. On the way home, I cranked up the Thompson Twins, Hold Me Now, a whiny little pop song, when I should have played What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding, or Pressure Drop, because by the time I got home to our two-story brown shingle across from the wrecking yard, the air had gone out of my chest. How should I account for the bullet hole, the unbalanced tires, the back seat infused with the smell of gasoline? Lord, have mercy on us. This is a poem called Drone from Michael Robbins, and it's a persona poem. It's a kind of a mashup, really, of a kind of a streetwise character based on the voice of Detective Holder in the AMC television series, The Killing. Holder is a streetwise detective ex-tweaker. And um, I've mashed up in that the sort of style of um, slightly hip hop and slightly iambic poetry that Michael Robbins published in his two books, Predator vs. Alien and Second Sex. So this is Drone from Michael Robbins. Drone. I've got an excuse to get loose. A quart of Maker's Mark downloaded to the shopping cart I filched from Walmart. I've hacked into Arnold Schwarzenegger's account. No room service at the Hilton. My mother married a professor, but to earn extra cash, she worked as a stripper. Man, she was sexy, shook her booty like she had epilepsy. Dared me to peek at the cooch I came from. There's no pilot on this plane, every hit a reality show. Shoot a missile into this bitch, lethal as a poem, then go home. Fuck the Taliban, they're the new Jews. Sickening to imagine them nude. When there's body parts on the road, my partner gets hard. He's got carpal tunnel from gripping the controls. Needs a self-driving car to take him to the titty bar where everything's blown up. Press against his ear a one-note solo. A blood-dim tide is loosed upon a word. This poem is called The Condition My Condition Is In. I imagine the poem being spoken by a persona, actually by a migrant uh, woman who's camped out looking for work in front of the Orchard Supply Hardware Store. The Condition My Condition Is In. Groggy and dehydrated, who's responsible for that? Who's driving the Google car? I need more spare change for a vaccination. Diphtheria is in my blood. Gonna take up a collection. This is the last day before my green card expires. If they don't know, how they gonna find me? I look like every other Arabian wetback. All that swarthy hair, etc. Como te llamas? You got papers? Toil and trouble, bitch. Like I'm gonna swim back across the border. So what if I missed my appointment? I can't chew gum anyway. All those hours ahead with nothing for me. I wait in front of Osh, my head an empty brown paper bag, while I tear my mind on the jagged sky, amusing the homies with corridos. I'm offside. I just dropped in to see what condition my condition is in. There's a skunk on the back steps, her head in a jello cup. I've risen twice out of the river. 
Red-eyed, three months pregnant, I squat in front of the Unitarian Church. I'm not scared of La Migra S.A. Mi hijo is short with big feet. Looks like a Mayan carving on a bas relief. I've named him Macro Alvaro de Jesus Holmes. Let him sleep, beating down every day. I don't know how the sun survives us.